Good morning. It was a great night for Canuck hockey fans last night. Beat those benighted New York Islanders two to one. And it was the Islanders who wiped them out, of course, in the Stanley Cup series. And the winning goal by the Canucks is a matter of some question, but who cares? Whether it went in or not, the Canucks got the goal. It counts. Shoveled it back. Over it comes. Bella, the Gradine. Roger Nielsen will tell you later on a Webster walkabout at the hockey that it was in the middle, but he won't tell you it on oath. Then on the more serious side, we had a look at the econ economy problems of Pacific Press, where 74 members of the Guild staff are being laid off. And the union are considerably concerned about the fact. They'll agree times ain't so good, but Jim Young, the president of the Guild local, wants something particular to happen. Are it's you prepared to accept these layoffs and face value at all? I am not. What do you want from the company? I want them to open their books and prove that indeed there is an economy problem. And also on the program this morning, the NDP's education critic, fellow by the name of Gary Locke of Vancouver Centre. After the break. It's 7 p.m. precisely. One hour before the league opener of the Canucks against the Rock. It's 7 p.m. precisely. One hour before the league opener of the Canucks against the rivals, those scoundrels who beat them four straight in the Stanley Cup only a matter of three, four months ago. People by the name of New York Islanders. Behind me lies the empty arena. Now, I'm a Canuck booster. I want them to win. But I sure as hell hope that halfway through the season, the stands don't look like the way they do now. So tonight, we're here to nag a little, complain a little, and boost a little to see what people think of before, during, and after the game of the Canucks, for which I have been buying season tickets now for 12 full years. This is the 13th season, and it better be good or it'll be the last time I buy season tickets. Let's go and meet some of the characters. I want to meet Mr. Flub Dub Al Davidson. I want to find wee uh, organ, wee Tommy Larshide, the impressive, uh, imperturbable bull, Jimmy Robson, and some of the old hands and some of my buddies who sit beside me in my expensive seat in the Reds. So let's go and have a look at what the Canucks are going to do tonight. Up to the press box. Oh, what an antiquated stadium this is with no elevators. To take old people up the top. Now, one more, I think. Oh! I'm the one that doesn't like heights. And here I am up in the rafters of the Coliseum because I've got to go over and find the NW broadcast booth and talk to Robson and Larshide and company. They're the hardest work working people in hockey, I don't mind telling you. Stairs, downstairs, all around town. However, I've got a surprise for two of my friends here. Oh. Jimmy Robson. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Jack. Is your voice in tune for this oh, season? Oh, I think so, sure. 
We've been horse, maybe. Oh, no, no. How long have you been doing this now, James? Well, uh, since the Canucks started in the National League, and prior to that, as long as you've been in Vancouver and beyond, I guess, in the I Western am, League. You're not that old. Oh, yes, I am. Jimmy, right. you're a magnificent broadcaster. You're, you. you're the only guy in the business. I like you, too, Jim. I really like. <laughs> Tell me, how's it going to look for this year? Well, everybody's optimistic. They've had a very good training camp. How them. about Jimmy Robson? Oh, well, me? Yeah. Well, we're not worried about me. We're worrying about the oh, athletes. No. Are you optimistic? Oh, sure. Very. I think uh, this is the best talent the Vancouver Canucks have ever had. I think my sidekick will back me up. Uh, before I talk to whoever's your sidekick, <laughs> I understand that you can tell every, every player in the National Hockey League by the shape of the back of his neck. Not anymore. They all wear helmets. It's uh, not the same as it used to be. Robinson says, get rid of helmets. Make my life easier. Right. Who is this little fellow? Who I'm is this little guy? <laughs> what are you talking about? I knew you when you were a shy, tight Scotsman. Now, I knew you. were you... still tight, but now you're a big TV star, right? I knew you when you had no knees. <laughs> That's Remember right, Jack. That? We go back a long way. We dummy lost, Jack. <laughs> hey, you're you looking came... great, Jack. Don't give me that nonsense. Is that your own hair? No, look at that. Don't get the bald spot now. Just get get the front profile. What a the transformation nose. you made, not only of your hair, but from football to now a distinguished hockey broadcaster. Well, you know, I looked around after I was finished playing football, and I listened to all your mumbo-jumbo on first CKNW, then CJOR, and I said, where can I go where I can make that kind of money and have as much fun? And you I'm having as much fun as you, Jack, but not near as much money. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to do something to lower the tone of your voice. I can't. It's That's me. what Davidson tells me. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Davidson, I mean... Where is He's the a legend in his own mind, you know. Yeah. Where is the wee man? <laughs> well, he should be up here. In fact, we go on the uh, the air at quarter to eight. He'll be here about 30 seconds before we go on the air. That's <laughs> yeah. right. And he'll either be denouncing somebody or licking their boots. No, it'll be the National Hockey League's on the air. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck, Tommy. Thank you, Jack. Good to see you. You too, Jimmy. God, do you work up here all... It's a little bit confined. Oh, no, it's very comfortable. You should see some of the places around the league. This is one of the best. Which is the worst? I remember you saying on the air once. Well, some place I guess you... Washington and Los Angeles are bad because you're right among the spectators. And Long Island used to be the worst, but now they have a brand new press box where the Islanders play, so it's a lot better. Thanks, Jimmy. Okay, thanks. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Baldy. All right, Jack. <laughs> Good to see you. It's Big Al, and tonight you have a reception committee, Big well, Al. For goodness it's sakes. Uncle Jack Webster. You finally made the big time. No, I came here to present my apologies on behalf of all the decent people in town about those thinks that are calling you names. Nobody calls me names, Jack. Only you call me names. Now, nah, listen, now it's the start of a new season. Yes. You'll be your usual, what's the word, ubiquitous, ebullient self. I'll try. You taught me. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 minutes before game time. That's right. I want the Davidson prediction of the future of the Canucks. The Canucks will end up playing 600 hockey this year. That's one better than 500 hockey. Well, 500, uh, there were less than that last year, and they went on to get in the final. I think they're improved about uh, 30 percent. I've had you carve the Canucks and their ownership and the, everybody upside down, but you've never said that, what's the name of this guy? But are we having a naval battle here? <laughs> no, we've got to squeeze together so we can get in the shot together. You understand that? We'd be great on kilts, wouldn't we? Did you ever actually play hockey? Yes, I did. Was that before the First World War? Uh, no, that was in Port Arthur, Ontario. I played with some pretty good guys, Danny Lewicki. Uh, they all made the NHL and Benny White. Then I, I quit growing. Listen, the rest of the guys went on to be Do me a favor players. and do one of your half past six in the morning insults for me. All right. I had you the other morning and you were kicking quitters in the football team and denouncing everybody in sight. Well, I'll tell you what, here we are in the Pacific Coliseum and there's no improvement in this building. I understand there's going to be, but promises, promises. There's a baseball game, the World Series. They're too cheap to put in cable vision so you can watch the baseball game on television. Who's too cheap? The PNE who owns the building. You mean Swan Guard is too cheap? Swan Guard, I'm not getting into an argument with Swan Guard. <laughs> <laughs> you can't win with him. 
Well, can we just get in with Let me with escort the old gentleman into uh, the booth <laughs> so he can say the National <laughs> Hockey League yeah. is on the air. Yeah. Yes. I think it's only right we tell this television crew, all these guys here, we uh, want Jack Webster, not Archie Bunker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's the Archie Bunker of the local scene. <laughs> Jack is the greatest thing in my life when I worked with you. I wish you're back with us again. You're doing a great job with what you're doing. Can uh, this keep team it make it? The team... Uh, uh, well, would you finish up screaming, Neil and Nielsen must go? No, I won't do that. You will if you have to. As long as they play entertaining hockey and give it their best, that's all you can do. And when? Uh, well, when, yes, but as long as they're entertaining. You never win, but you're always entertaining. Watch yourself on the two valve. You'll go on a diet instantly. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> See you later, Jack. Thanks, Al. Okay. You can... Richard, can I give you your pitch? You can give me my pitch, Jack, and Which I'll Which do you catch want? It. Do you want the Canadian anthem or do you want the Stars and Stripes? Oh, you got to give me the Stars and Stripes. Stars and Stripes. Star Spangled Banner, Jack. Star Spangled Banner. Right. That's it. Oh, the Bandon Tattle. No, I can't that's, do that's it. That's the one. Do you want me to do it for you? You do it for me. Oh, say, can you see? Enough. 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 I'm ready. All due respect. Now, O Canada, I remember you had trouble with the changed words in O Canada. Did I have to, well, actually, Jack, it wasn't the changed English words. It was the French I was doing, and I got a little bit of a raspberry from behind one night, and it kind of threw me a little. But you still do the French. Uh, no, don't do the French anymore. Uh, you got to do it now and again. It, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, we're working on it. Richard, uh, you put out a record. Yes, I did. Did Jack? it sell? Oh, yes, it is selling very well. It's a Christmas album, so you've got to, you know, I've only got a couple of months a year to sell it. <laughs> Richard, this is your 13th season singing Old Canada. You're absolutely right, Jack. It's, you, uh, and you've never been off with a cold. Well, I must admit, I have had a couple of nights when I've uh, I haven't been able to really get anything out, and I've uh, yes, we've we've faked it a little on two occasions. I you shouldn't mean, say oh, that. But you mean faked it? You mimed it to a record. That's the idea. It's that's like not you, too just bad. like you do on television. Richard, the best of luck for you and your 13th season and the Canucks. Thank you, Jack. I and appreciate we'll it. And we'll stick by them even if they flub it this oh, year. Oh, absolutely, for sure. Thanks. Where's your tie? Uh, it's coming on later. I'm just getting warmed up. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Jack. What do you do when you're not singing? Yeah. Well, uh, when I'm not singing here, I'm busy teaching high school, North Vancouver. What do you teach? French. <laughs> <laughs> have oh, you yeah, you asked. Have you accepted the rollback? Um, I'm working on that as well, Jack. I wouldn't want to commit myself now, but... No, uh, but I, especially... Well, I always thought you were such a nice guy. I didn't know you were a teacher. Didn't you? Well, there are a lot of nice teachers. <laughs> no, thanks, Richard. <laughs> okay, Jack. Well, let's go and see the man, Glenn Major, the organist who whips the crowd into a frenzy on every appropriate occasion. Glenn, how are you? Fine, Mr. Webster. Can I butt in? <laughs> you bet. How do you spell your last name, which means I don't know it? Major, M-A-G-E-A-U. Play me a couple of bars of exciting post-goal music. You mean like na 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 na? Try it. <laughs> yeah. Good. End of the first period, and look who's standing here signing books. But Tony Gallagher and Mike Gasher who wrote a book called Towel Triumph and Tears, right? We did in that, and we did indeed, Jack, and uh, we're kind of happy we did. Uh, this is the kind of atmosphere I think that was created uh, in those run of games. Mind and, you, uh, it took them 10 years to get to the stage where you're writing books. It took them 13. This is their 13th year, and uh, they look a little stronger this year, but I don't think they're going to win the Stanley Cup. It's going to take them a while. Our sequel may not be for another 10 oh, years. No, I'm a, not, I'm a hockey nut. They've got to win it this year. Surely they can win it. You must be joking. There's no chance, really. There's 10 clubs better. Well, eight clubs better than they are, for sure. First period tonight wasn't too bad. Not too bad at all. Poor power play. The Islanders are in low gear for the moment, but uh, they'll start to get moving around Christmas. Tony, you've got to go off, but uh, Mike, just in capsule form, tell me the story of uh, the towels and the triumph, the towels and the tears. And that incredible fine that they put on poor Nielsen. I see some towels tonight, you know, and it reminds me of that game. Second game, Chicago series last year, Chicago Stadium, noisiest rink in the place. Canucks are down 3-1. to one. They take it over the blue line. Kurt Fraser goes to the goal. He scores. It's 3-2, to two, late. Offside. There's this, all of a sudden, Branham and Fraser swinging. There's a penalty, no goal. 
And up come the towels. And a and little that, bit of history was made. That was the history. Was that the night Nielsen himself threw his towel over? Yep, you raise it up on the stick. Uh, and it became they got a, a symbol. They got a symbol and a $10,000 fine. What did you think of that first period? Pretty good. Canucks looked more dangerous. Did he have to pay that $10,000 fine? No, it was only a performance bond. I think he paid the one grand and the 10000 came back from the league. Tony, how's the book going? A little too early to tell, but fairly well, we think. Towels, triumph, and tears. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Best of luck. Oh, by the way, haven't we met before somewhere, sir? I don't think so. Hurling's my game. Is this your, is this your first time at a hockey game? It certainly is. I'm straight from the old country. I never saw the game before. Okay. Keep your head up and you'll enjoy it. Thank you. Nice to see you, sir, whoever you are. Webster with Webster's World. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Seriously. <laughs> what did you think of that first period? It wasn't bad. You know, power plays is not too good, but other than that, they were scrambly, but it wasn't bad. But New York are a bunch of slick bullies anyway, aren't they? That's for sure. Look tougher we're than We're going to get them the second period, Jack. How about you? Is this your mother's towel? Yeah. What are you doing with a towel here? Shake it. Okay, well, keep up your enthusiasm. Hey, Jack, when it's tough gets rough, the rough gets tough. We're getting tougher and tougher every game. All the way. All the way to the uh, cup. Man, power. power. Got it. Okay, thanks very much. Nice to meet you. What do you know about hockey, though? Oh, I know a little bit. Not too much. You think they'll win the Stanley Cup this year? They're going to give it a good try. Give it a good try, eh? That's what about. Here's a, a lady. Here's a lady here. Lady, is this your first time at the game? No, I've been season ticket holder for about seven years. Shut up. How long have you been? I've been, been going to them for about eight years. Eight years. Had season That's tickets for so years. So. They might even pick up the Stanley Cup this year. Yeah, Thanks very sure. much. What are you up Dave to? Babe, how are you, Jack? Tallest man in the crowd. How are you hitting them? What are you talking about? Customers or golf balls? <laughs> <laughs> You're hitting everybody around here tonight, A Jack. quick, cold analysis of the first period. You did? No, you give me one. A quick analysis? Yeah. Terrific hitting period, Jack. We'll fill this joint all season long with that kind of hockey. The power play wasn't much good there, was well, it? Well, I know, but there was a few strangers in there. Don't worry about the power play. Just worry about Roger stopping them. And uh, Big Halinka putting the puck in the net. Oh, and that goal in the first period by Lars Lindgren. Yeah, beautiful play. Beautiful Especially play. with uh, playing against the uh, Trache line. See, this is the big line. By the way, Jack, you know, if you could hit the golf ball like you broadcast, you know, you'd give that Nicholas a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> when did you last have hockey gear on? Oh, about 20 years ago. <laughs> you mean 40 years ago? No, 20. <laughs> <laughs> nice to but see you, Ben. Nice to see you, Jack. Hope you have a good year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, Jack. Hi, Hi. how are you? Hi. Oh, nice to see you. Yeah. Okay, what do you... What did you make of them tonight? Pardon? What was that again? What do you make of them? It's a good good game. It's a good game. How many beers have you had? Ah, uh, it's only yeah. my third one. My third one. <laughs> oh, he's at 10. What did you make of them tonight? All right. Hi, Mom! Hi, Dad! <laughs> It's impossible. It's impossible. One more over here. How's it going? What's your name? John. Where from? Birmingham, England. You don't know anything about hockey. I do too. You're not entitled to comment. Yes, I am. I'll comment. Steamer. Great stuff. Great. Uh, yeah, it was a good win. You know, always the first one's always... Uh... It, it didn't go in. That <laughs> second goal didn't go hey, in. Hey, Jack, you work hard <laughs> enough, we'll take it. Anything, <laughs> you know. Any, kind of, it's a pity that we hadn't been the last game in the last session with them. That's right. Two out of couldn't have been, uh, I guess, uh, in, in the springtime, I guess. But uh, what the heck, you got to take it. We worked hard for it, you know, Jack, and it's, it's a good feeling. Best of luck, Stanley. Great, we're going to need it. Show me somebody else that I can chat to. Somebody okay, Jack, I'll just find, I'll find one of the, the, How about Tiger? the fastest guy in the nets, Richard Bruder. King Richard. King Richard. Thank you. It's old Uncle Jack Webster. How did it feel tonight? It felt very good, you know, beating those guys. Well, it's a great, great way to start the season. You know, when you beat a champion right out of the bat, well, prove that we're for real, I guess. Yeah, you've only got how many games to go? Well, only 7-9 plus uh, maybe, what, 17 in playoff. we got a Stanley Cup. 
God, you feel, did you feel good tonight? I felt pretty good. I felt pretty good. Hope you have a great year. Thank you very much. I Thanks appreciate very it. much. Thank Thanks very much. First time I've been in a locker room of a hockey club. <laughs> Maybe it should be the last time. Dave, will you say hello Josh, to me? How are you? Jack Webster. Yeah. How did you feel where out there you, where, tonight? Where do you work? Do you have a job? I work for BC Television. Oh, at 9 a.m. precisely. Precisely. Yeah, and you did, did a good stick for me. Was it last Christmas? Yes, I did. What do you think of the game tonight? I thought it was a great game. Do you know anything about the game? Sure I do. I'm a fan. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, but there's lots of fans that don't know anything. Well, I'll tell you something. What? Gradine's goal didn't go into the net. That doesn't matter. It taint there. It taint, it's tainted, but who cares? It taint theirs. How's that for a joke? <laughs> yeah, well, the bottom line is... You came off the ice pretty hot there. Who are you mad at? Well, uh... The game's over we won, so I'm not mad at anybody, but it's, when I come off, I was a little upset. Best of luck, Tiger. Th thank you. Best of luck to you. See you again. Goody, goody gumdrops. Huh? You want to do a good report? Yeah. yeah. Interview this broads in our dressing room. Broads in the dressing room. I should not be allowed. Why not? I because. Don't great. be great silly. Idea. What's wrong with the broad in the dressing room? Because this is Everybody my this is my office. Do you get? Do I come walking in your office? Do they come walking in your office nude? I got to work around here, and I got a women hanging I'm around. I'm never nude in the office. Well, it shouldn't be a lot. Are you chewing snuff? Are you chewing snuff? Don't be silly. <laughs> what do you me. think about? You see that, that black eye you've yeah. got? Yeah. Do you like the matching one? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I think it's perf they're perfectly entitled to come in, whether you're naked or they're naked or not. Which? You're out the left field on that one. Just out to lunch. Woman, out of the dressing room, really. <laughs> That's Naomi. <laughs> All the experts are telling me that you you coach dull games not true is You're it really right no that's right uh, we uh, we don't play dull at all and uh, that was a really exciting game and i'm sure all the fans liked it best of luck roger thank you john and it did go in did it right in the middle you sure absolutely on oath <laughs> well let's not get carried away now <laughs> thanks roger best of luck okay jack the first game of the season is over we won two to one after losing four straight in the Stanley Cup to the same ugly bullies from New York. So there it is. What's left to go before they win the Stanley Cup this year, or get into the Stanley Cup again? Quite simple. There are four groin injuries, 10 sprained ankles, 14 bashed knees, five new set of teeth, a couple of back aches, and quite a few black eyes, and 79 games before the playoff. Ah, let's not be objective about this. I hope they stick together. I hope they win. We deserve it after 13 years of watching them. It's no exaggeration to say that the Guild members at the Pacific Press were shocked and stunned when they got the layoff notices for 74 of their people. Uh, only the Guild was really affected right off the bat. First, we're going to talk to Bill Wheatley, who's the general manager of Pacific Press, about this problem. I always feel a bit uh, vaguely ghoulish or ghoulish when I do stories on problems in newspapers, perhaps because of my own particular background. But here I am in the office of the Pacific Press office of the president and the general manager, Bill Wheatley. Bill, it was a blow to see you make an announcement the other day, Mr. Wheatley, that you're laying off 74 members of the guild. That's right. Now, why only members of the guild? Why not other people? Well, we did lay off some non-union people as well prior to this particular layoff. Our other union contracts are on manning basis rather than on, uh, on uh, just uh, totals of people so that as the product drops in size, so, so does the manning drop down, with the exception of the composing room where they have lifetime guarantees. The composing room has lifetime guarantees which came out of the 77 strike, is that correct? Uh, I believe it was before that, although I'm not positive. It came out of the change in technology from hot metal to uh, 
faced up. And for accepting that, the, the typo, typo men were given lifetime guarantees for their jobs. That's right. So no matter what happens, they're secure. That's right. Within the terms of their particular contract. Exactly. Now, when you come to the mailers and the pressmen, they have guarantees based on the number of papers you run over a month or over a year. No, they're manning depending on how many units and how many pages a day. Mm -hmm. We also have a guarantee for pressmen, but we don't have too many pressmen. Right at the moment. Uh, that right at the moment, that's right. So when you decided to make a layoff there for the only place where you could cut under the terms of your contract at one fell swoop, 74 people, was in the guild. Oh, and non-management, or at least in non-union. Non-union, like uh, right. supervisory non-union uh, staff. That's right, or, or some, some personal secretaries that are not within the contract. Now, but that's the only area. Well, when you hit up the editorial in the guild, what categories actually are you, have you given notice to lay off by the end of October? Well, we haven't uh, actually in the, in the editorial departments. There are not that many uh, people involved. Uh, there are more people in other functions in the, in the business, and quite frankly, I couldn't break them down for you. Uh, exactly as to who they are, but they all have a bumping privilege so that it will probably move down to the least seniority people. So it could be janitors, uh, retail ad clerks, all that kind of that's, category. That's right. And about a half a dozen editorial full-time and part-time. On both papers, on each paper, yes. Now, corporate structure is always a tricky thing to understand in this particular field. Is Pacific Press an operational unit of Southams? That's right. And does Pacific Press run its own balance sheets? We run them to a degree, but not completely. They're all consolidated with head office's figures. Mind you, I've got to give the son a pat on the back for running the story by Phil Needham the other day, and I've got to read the first paragraph. It says, the president of Southam Inc. that owns Pacific Press Limited and reported net earnings of 44.67 million in the year ending December 31st, 1981, said Friday, the Pacific Press staff members are being laid off because Pacific Press is simply not now making money. Right. Could you tell me how much you're losing? Uh, no, actually, he, what, uh, he said that we are not now making money, and that is back since June. Uh, our figures show that since the first of the year, we are slightly into a lost position when we consider uh, the debt costs on things, uh, the capital equipment that we've put into the building. Yeah, but so that on the, on the year we are. We are, in fact, losing money this year. But many an outsider would say, name of goodness, Southam's made 44.67 net last year. Couldn't they swallow the losses in Pacific Press? Well, last year's figures, of course, were a record for Southam, and since the first of the year, they have not been in that uh, area at all. And there was some extraordinary items in that particular year that boosted that uh, figure up. Yeah, but uh, you hired a lot of people not so long ago in Southam's. That's right. Well, we have hired since the 1978 contract here a considerable number of people, and as a matter of fact, have hired more guild people than we're laying off. So you hired a number, and now you're laying them off. But are these temporary layoffs, or with your knowledge and feeling of the economic climate, do you think these people have gone one way and another forever? Uh, I would hope not. Uh, I would. I can't foresee in the, in the immediate future any change in the business, though. I, I see it as a fairly long-term recessive tendency, and. Uh, Hopefully, I hope I'm wrong. I don't think I am, however. I think it might be into 1984 before business starts to pick up again. When you say that lineage is down, is it down very badly? Yes, it's down. Uh, we're running now down more than 25% uh, on both the Sun and the province. Lineage, by that you mean all uh, advertising, national, local, and classified? Well, mo the, uh, the big losses are in national and classified, not in local advertising. The local advertising is holding about even with last year. The classified and, and particularly national are well off. Now, you'll tell me to mind my own business if I'm pushing too hard, but Pacific Press is a separate operational unit of Southams with its own balance sheets, but is part of the overall corporation. That's right. And the instructions, obviously, are that each unit of Southams, including the one on the Pacific Coast, must not lose money. No, that's not necessarily true. I worked in the Winnipeg Tribune for six years, and we budgeted and lost money every year. And, of course, the, the province has been the money loser on the West Coast here for a number of years. That's right. Lose money badly? Well, we consolidate our, our expenses so that we don't have an, ac an exact breakout of what the, the province's situation, because when you get below the editorial and advertising and circulation departments, all the rest of it is consolidated expense. But the average union guy can't look at the at the profits of Southam, the overall healthy profits of Southam, and think, well, they should carry Pacific Press. Well, all of Southam is down this year, and uh, the, the losses in lineage have been accelerating since uh, the f end of the first quarter. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been in newspapers a long while and run p 
papers all over the country, right? Right. Do you think this uh, might mean the death of the province? Because that's what the speculation is. The province is in trouble. The province will go under. The sun's the better of the two papers in terms of money, and therefore the sun must survive. Well, there's been no consideration of that at this particular point in time. Uh, I don't foresee it myself. Uh, we have talked about that for many years and probably continue to talk about it, but uh, it is not a part of a plan that we have at this moment. That's but, uh, Pacific Press must stand on its own feet so that it can not draw too much on southern profits. That's right. And I think we can. Given uh, normal business conditions, I don't think there's any problem doing that and still having two newspapers. Yeah. Our problem now is, is uh, accentuated by the economy of British Columbia. Bit of a blow. Somehow or other it seems to affect us more when we see newspaper guys being laid off than almost anybody else. Maybe it's just our own selfish, incestuous insight. Well, yes, and it disturbed me, it uh, particularly disturbed me, because as I mentioned, I had been involved in Winnipeg, and these are heartrending times when this sort of thing happens, and I hope that this is the end of it. I hope that now our business will begin to increase and things will pick up again. Well, you've heard Bill Wheatley, the plant manager at Pacific Press, tell us why 74 people are being laid off. A dreadful shock to the newspaper community in this particular town. And now I'm just waiting at the Guild office to find out what the executive have done after the most recent meeting. The first guy I want to talk to is Jimmy Young. How do you do, Jack? God, how long have you been back as president of the Guild? Oh, all of a year. How many strikes have I covered at the Sun, say, between 70 and 80? Well, there's been a few. I've lost track myself, but I, I remember uh, spending a, a social hour with you in 1970 down in your uh, studios. Matter of fact, between 1970 and 1980, how much time did you spend on the picket lines? A tenth of that time. Uh, one year, over one year, that uh, ten-year period was on a picket line. Okay, what happened today, Jimmy? Did these layoffs come really as a brutal shock, or because of the general this and that in the economy, you, you kind of expected them, maybe? Well, uh, no, uh, Jack, I cannot honestly say I expected them. Uh, we uh, met with the company earlier this spring, and the company talked about the economy and the hard times and asked the Guild at that time for some flexibility. Flexibility, uh, that means surrender a few jobs. Well, no, it meant uh, that uh, in areas like uh, where uh, work was disappearing or there was a shortage of work through austerity that they wouldn't replace people. Uh, they wouldn't replace people who had on one week vacations where we had adequate. Are you prepared to accept these layoffs and face value at all? I am not. What do you want from the company? I want them to open their books and prove that indeed there is an economy problem. Doug Louth, your title in the union, Doug? Treasurer. Treasurer. Now maybe you know something about money. Are Southerns losing money? Uh, well, in my opinion, they're not, Jack. I think they, uh, they're making money. Uh, we are the guild as shareholders. In the, uh, in, the sh in, in the southern chain, we have 400 common shares, and to date so far, we have received uh, $160, which is uh, $480, which is 40 cents a common share. And uh, my I know, there's, there's no argument about that. I mean, Bill Wheatley confirms, as was in the Sun, that Southerns made $44.67 million last year. But as I gather it, who here can trace the ownership of the? the papers in the plant quickly off the top of their head. Can you do it, uh, Roy? Roy Tubbs. Trace the ownership? The ownership. We'll go back to the days when oh, first okay. Chromie owned the paper and That's the right. Southerns owned the it, province. Sold the province to... Well, uh, first of all, they carved up Roy, Roy Thompson. They carved up the market with Roy Thompson. That's right. In the News Herald. Okay. That's right. So then we had Pacific Press Limited with both papers in the same bed. Right. And then Thompson came in. He bought Pacific Press. Am I right? That's right. 
Uh, he, he, the shortly after, he bought the he, sun. He bought the sun shortly after the sun. The strike. Right. And then Southerns moved in and took it all over. That's right. Now, is this a reasonable request that you should ask to see the books of this giant corporation, Roy? Yes. That is an absolutely uh, reasonable request because of the bona fides. Uh, when they're talking about an economic layoff, uh, it's very difficult for, for anyone to take them at face value. And when they're making these large profits. Of course, and paying dividends, too. Mind you, Whitley was quite honest as a question the Pacific Press is losing money. Maybe, maybe Dean, this is Dean. Dean Catchoff. Dean, no, it's not. It's something else, but we'll call it Catchoff. How do you <laughs> spell it? Enough. It's T-K-A-T-S-C-H-O-W. Good enough, Dean. Uh, is Pacific Press a place that's been overloaded? I'm sure this is what the management would tell me, that I think compared to other papers, your staffing here is much heavier than elsewhere. Well, they uh, compared the Toronto uh, Star, or, or sorry, the uh, Windsor Star originally, and they gave figures. And the question I think that we have to ask is, are they trying to streamline the Pacific Press operation? I think that you, if you looked at Southam stock earlier this year, it bottomed out around $24. It's been increasing. It's been in a plus position. It's moving up the ladder again. And uh, the big thing, I think, as far as our membership, we've totally tried to cooperate with them. We've given them flexibility in vacations. We've given them flexibilities in leaves of absence. We've given them flexibilities um, in, in a wide area. To the two strong points, I want to go to Jimmy. You've got 74 named people laid off, that's, right? That's correct. Um, is there going to be a... Must you accept this? Or have you any weapons you can use to try and save the jobs? What can you actually do now? Well, c uh, under our collective agreement, we believe that we can take this to arbitration. We believe that uh, the company has an obligation to open their books to us. And that's what we're asking them to and do. And if you get into arbitration, does everything stay on hold? Well, that's a good question, Jack. Uh, I asked this of the company in a meeting we held with them this morning. Uh, that's the conditions prevailing, 6-6 uh, six, six in our grievance procedure. Uh, they, they replied that they'd give me an answer on that tomorrow. You got to, that, that, uh, that's finished. Now, now uh, the first chill wind dug was when they laid off the summer students, wasn't it? Uh, in I the editorial. I believe that was the first indication, Jack, uh, and plus the fact that they... Uh, and we were kind of built up for this because they ran a page one story, a feature on the layoff of the summer students, as I recall, being an astute newspaper watcher. Now, is there any senior, if, if you have to take these, what about the bumping? Uh, does it all go specifically under your contract with the, the length of employment with Pacific Press? I believe uh, that's uh, the way that we're going you to... You believe that? that, that we're what does the company believe? Well, um, they have not really, I think, uh, in, in the meetings that I've attended, have committed themselves to anything yet because simply uh, we are grieving, uh, you know, all the layoffs. Uh, but I understand that there are some people with seven or even 14 years service who are uh, technically down for the layoffs. Yeah, there seems to be some problem in that. In fact, they admitted today a very a, a sincere error that they've made in the fact where they were laying, uh, had given notice to lay off all the messengers uh, in the building, which would totally wipe them out. This is the people that uh, pick up the mail and and walk around and they admitted that uh, that was wrong when they found that out so it doesn't seem to me that they know where they're going mm -hmm. it's a tough situation uh, something else I was going to ask you Roy what the devil was it about um, you've got the possibility of bumping you've got 74 named positions uh, you hope to put the whole thing on hold if you can with our conditions prevailing yes yeah doesn't seem very healthy does it no it doesn't and, uh, the oh yeah I know I was going to ask you have they given any real incentive for golden handshakes among the people who are laid off or to be laid off? They've uh, offered people over 55 years of age and early retirement possibility uh, to be individually negotiated. Uh, what that means, I'm not quite sure. They also... Uh, That's not the people who are listed as to be laid off necessarily. No, they're no. still going. Well, and, would, and if they, anybody took the buyback, would that cut down the number of layoffs? No. No. No, no. no. that was clearly stated. As mm, a matter of fact, correct. in our meeting, when we had the 51 and, and 23, which the original number was, we asked them to clarify if they were attempting to achieve a percentage of payroll saving. And if they were, if people took early retirement or voluntarily resigned, would that affect the number of persons laid off? And the answer was no. So it's 74 at the moment, plus buyback attrition, whatever they can achieve that for people between 55 and 65. That's accurate. Well, we've got no editorial people here, but... Maybe it wouldn't affect the standard of uh, newspapers in Vancouver, Jimmy Young. 
Well, that's hard to say at this time. Uh, and, uh, one thing that we did do at our information meeting today, Jack, is uh, appoint a special committee uh, and to, to try to determine just exactly uh, how uh, all of these, and one of that, of course, will be one of the questions. Mind you, with, with anything between 10 and 25,000 IWA men out of any one type, should we bother about 74? Newspaper employees. Oh no, the guild. It's the guild only that's being hit that's by only, this. It's only the guild that is uh, getting the effects of the labor. Why not the right? ITU? Protection in manning. What do you mean? Protection in their manning clauses. You mean they've got lifetime security that's right. under the 77 well, or 78 yeah. agreement? In fact, yeah. in fact, in the area of the composing room right now, they've made an offer uh, to the individuals that are over 55 to buy them out for $14,700 plus uh, severance pay or whatever. So they, they would like to reduce the size of the composing room, but they're coming after the guild. We always bite the bullet. Why is that? Because we don't have the protection of manning. Because you're the least protected That's in right. Manning. How about the mailers? Mailers, or they say there's no problem right there. Right Pressmen. No problem there. And the other staffs, no problem. No problem. They're coming after the guild right now. Yeah. Has anybody? Oh, have they offered any of your people fourteen thousand golden handshakes? No, but at the bottom of a uh, letter that was uh, from Mr. Wheatley, who's the president of the company, he indicated that he would be willing to buy out certain individuals if they're in the retirement age bracket. So they are. It, it looks like they're trying to cut down the size. Streamline. Okay. We'll try and keep you in touch with the Pacific Press crisis as it develops. There's no argument at all that the economy and the drop in advertising lineage is a basic problem. The union wants to see the books, to see if the Pacific Press section of uh, Southam's can, in fact, justify the cutbacks. Next, we're going to talk to a man who caused a great storm and commotion this summer. But he's here particularly as the education critic for the NDP, Gary Locke, Vancouver Centre, after the break. You know, the securities and exchange. It's very easy to overdo an interview, you know, on occasions and rub things in that shouldn't be rubbed in. So let me put a little sardonic, well, a smile on my face, not even sardonic to Gary Locke and say, that was quite a day when you caused the Canadian dollar to drop on international exchanges. Do you wish it had never happened? Well, uh, there are always times when politicians wish things didn't happen, but I'm not terribly uh, concerned about it. Uh, the, the, uh, the overreaction of the financial community to my speech was something that amazed everybody, including me. You didn't realize the clout you had, that because you said certain things about the one particular bank, Commerce, the dollar went down. Well, who would, who would have ever guessed that a NDP backbencher in, in a sleepy little fishing village on the Pacific Rim could have made a speech that brought down the Canadian dollar. As a matter of fact, though, just, to, just as a matter of interest, I'm reading in the Globe and Mail this morning, uh, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce head defends the rescue operation for Dome Petroleums. And he says, do you realize if they hadn't saved Dome, it would have been the biggest bankruptcy in the world. A Canadian company with seven billion in debt goes bankrupt with every major bank in the world involved. Do you realize, he says, what that would have done to, the Canadi to Canada? The credit of the Canadian banking system, and apparently commerce of 1.05 billion out in loans to that, would have been in question, and the Canadian government itself, its credit would have been in question. So don't feel too badly about it now. Oh, I don't. Look, the substance of my speech was correct. It was just the bottom line that received all the attention, which when I, you know, Pushed it a little bit too hard. I think so. We people with access to media tend on occasions to push things too hard. I would concede that sometimes, mm. but at the same... In fact, you were guilty of what's often the, the guilt uh, attached to people like myself of a little bit of sensationalism. Well... There's also the aspect that I pointed out that the emperor wasn't wearing any clothes. And the banking system, uh, sometimes I feel the banking system in Canada is held in more reverence than some of our churches. And uh, that disturbs me because the major loan policy of our major Canadian banks is very, very reckless in the last two or three years. I don't like it. I think it has to be straightened out. 
and those few people in the boardroom of the ma a major Canadian bank shouldn't risk the credit rating of an entire nation. Well, I've said before, when you look back at all the financial tycoons and genii that run the magnificent affairs of this country, not a single one of them apparently knew last fall or last spring what was going to happen to certain sections of our troubled economy. That's absolutely wrong. Their own economists in the banking system warned them about a recession in the 1980s. I quite modestly say I made a speech in 1979 saying that there'd be a major recession in the 1980s, which was reported in the city dailies. Um, uh, I got that information from reading the, the, the banking system's own economists and, and American publications. Let's get down to cases, though. You're here to defend these teachers who say that if they Wrong. have a rollback of any kind or if they lose a five uh, paid non-instructional professional, professional development days, they shall be in slavery. That's garbage. Well, I'm not going to... Oh, no. Question. Is that garbage? <laughs> <laughs> I won't comment on that. What I will say, Jack, is that I'm not here to defend teachers. I'm here to defend the oh, education system. They're going to spend money in the campaign to help the NDP, I'm sure. Well, I don't know whether they're going to spend... They're certainly not going to spend money in our campaign. Now, if they run their own campaign, that's their business. But let's deal with how this thing has been handled. You know, I did not get the impression that the teachers were against restraint. However, we've got this widespread view that there'll be total lack of cooperation from the teachers. But let me point out something to you. Before this new bill, which I call a, a bludgeon, 74 of the 75 school districts in the province of British Columbia provided the Ministry of Education with a plan of cutbacks to meet ministry guidelines. All of those plans were negotiated and agreed to between the trustees and the teachers of each district. We must have been in a different world. Okay, but let me tell you something. Because I had Mr. Van der Zam here, changing policy every five minutes and making, uh, subjecting himself to pressure from Beijan and from the teachers, and the people out in Surrey didn't know whether they were coming or going when they suddenly realized that they could put people off for professional development days and save, what was it, 66 or 102 jobs. Well, the point is that that the various restraint packages that were formulated by each district was done on a democratic basis, and it seemed okay. The, mi the minister himself issued a statement before this new bill came down saying, I'm very pleased that the school districts have done their restraint. No, that was because he bludgeoned them. He just said, do it your own way, do it no, your no, own way, is, do it your own way. All right. He, he gave them no guidelines he forced of any kind until he was back into on, a he corner. For he forced the issue. Now we find the premier moving in on the white horse, taking the position that he's going to save education from Bill van der Zam, he personally sits down with the Deputy Minister of Education, that's the Premier, and writes this act. He uh, pushes van der Zam aside and pretends that he's disciplining van der Zam. What he's really doing is trying to create a political issue with the education system. He's trying to isolate the teachers from the public and create a political issue so he can fight an election on it. That is the bottom line. This bill has nothing to do with cutbacks. It has everything to do with an election issue. It also has something to do with cutbacks. No, it, it hasn't. It's not going to work. the wages of all employees of the school board, except <coughs> those covered by a uh, collective agreement. It reduces them by an amount equal to five working days' pay, which saves hundreds of millions of dollars. But the districts, substantially, without this kind of bludgeoning uh, uh, legislation, had agreed with most of their teachers to do this, precisely. Well, Did you know that, Jack? No, I didn't. Well, it's a fact. I don't accept that. Well, why don't you? I think maybe 25 or 30 of them, but not 74 or 75. Well, I'm saying that 74 districts submitted cutback plans. And for next year, it cuts five, it cuts all off all professional development days, and it reduces, where they don't agree, installments of pay by two working days' pay, and gives them 12 minutes and 48 seconds extra in the classroom to make way for the five early closure days of school. What nonsense. That's in the bill. I know it's in the bill, but 12 and a half minutes, I mean, let's nonsense. get serious. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's nonsense. a joke. The bill is a political bill. Most of this could have been achieved in a much better way, sensible way, through negotiation. And, and what they've done, you see, it's easy, Jack, to, to divide neighbor against neighbor and get the teachers uh, isolated. 
That doesn't take any brains if you want to create that as an election issue. What takes leadership and skill is getting these people together and working out on a cooperative basis how to cut back. Nobody's against restraint. I'm against mismanagement and, and using the uh, education system as a, as, a, uh, an edu uh, as a political football. What do you mean nobody's against restraint? The teachers have been fighting through the leadership to nail any cutback in money. You know that. Partly with reason, because they've got no working agreements with most of the school boards and have no say and were given no guidelines and no consultation. But they're scrambling to keep their salary base the same for next year's negotiations. And they also got an average, what was it, 15% last year, 17.3 down to 15. The yeah. teachers are not a hard done by profession, are they? I don't think so, but uh, let me tell you something. That's Why should they get away with, with all their increases when other people are suffering? When you have 221,000 people drawing unemployment, and claiming unemployment insurance in BC. Well, look, that's a good argument, except that it, it doesn't really hold up. If, if the teachers did get a good settlement, the last settlement, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's fine. They're willing to roll back on their professional days. A lot of them are. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is a negotiated settlement keeping their contracts intact. And you know about labor law as well as I do, that if you start legislating rollbacks into contracts without agreement, you've got some big problems. This is not going to uh, solve the problem. We're worried about 1983. Question. Has he lost the school teachers and the budget cuts as a potential election issue? I think he has, because I think that most people can see through it. Do you know that school districts are not going to survive and their programs are not going to survive as a result of this? Except that no teachers shall be laid off according to the, the dogma from Victoria. Now. Nonsense. It says without the minister's consent. But I know of, it, of at least 50% of the districts do not have the money even after these restraints to meet and keep their programs intact. For next year? For 1983. Webster and Gary Locke after the break. The fact remains, said Webster to Gary Locke, we've, everybody's been horrified by the explosion of education costs at a time when pupil numbers are dropping and still dropping radically. No, they're and not. It, yes, they are. No. Yes, they are. They've been dropping to date, but they're now increasing. Now, but that's not the point. The point is that we have some of the lowest cost per pupil uh, figures anywhere in the country. Second highest in the country. No. $3,200 is my memory. $3,200. Alberta's higher, Saskatchewan's higher, uh, and Ontario is higher. By $23, Ontario is higher. Per no, by several hundred dollars in Alberta, for example. Well, let me change the topic anyway. I understand that you recently had a, a rollback in your salary of some $1,750. Would you kindly explain how you got yourself in such a position well, whereby you had to accept a rollback? Well, I, I reported to the uh, legislative clerks that uh, I was absent on uh, certain days towards the end of the legislative session in the summer. I was in Europe on an educational conference, uh, and uh, as a result, I don't expect to be paid for days I'm not in the legislature. So I freely paid that back to the uh, to the. Well, what's the action taken against you by the legislature, the impression oh, I, I got? Well, I know a lot of people got that impression. I'm not, I won't be discussing that on, on the air, but that's not true. The no, truth is that each MLA is in charge of his own affairs, and uh, he files his own report by way of an affidavit with the legislative clerks. They don't go behind that report, and I have always filed honest reports with the clerks. In other words, you, you say, I wasn't here such and such a day for whatever reason, and your money is docked that particular amount. Well, you pay it. It's a form. It's really like a payback. It's docked for that month to pay back the days that you weren't in the legislature. Well, I'm going over to Victoria today to hopefully deduce a couple of things in depth. Perhaps you can give me a little bit of nonpartisan advice on the climate. I would love to. N not nonpartisan, of course. Nonpartisan. But uh, the fact is that this government is this government seems still to be teetering on the razor's edge from an election. Now, what indications have, can you tell me that he's called off or will call off an election and wait till the spring? My estimation... He being Premier Bennett, of course. Yeah. I've never seen it, it like this in Victoria. It is like waiting in the trenches in full battle dress with your pack and bayonets fixed and so on for several weeks. 
The problem is that the, that the premier is governing by poll. His party evidently is paying a lot of money and on a daily or, or 48 hour basis he's getting polling information. And when the thermometer goes up, he puts the election machinery on alert. When the thermometer goes down, he, he takes it off alert. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, you can govern by poll. The province is suffering. The education system is, is, is becoming an education foot, or political football. Health care is suffering in this province. No major moves for economic recovery are being taken by this government because he's on the phone to his poll researchers every day. Let's have a look at though. He's got his very attractive mortgage easy payment delay plan, right? You voted for it. Oh, yes. So therefore, that's a good plan if you voted for it. Or was it's, that a case where you didn't something. dare vote against it? Well, we wouldn't vote against it, but I'll tell you why. It's, it's something for some people that need it. However, you and Edgar Kaiser are eligible under that plan, and I don't think that's right. I don't know what the reference is to me and Edgar Kaiser, but I got Money. You. you don't need the money. You don't? You? Mm. No, I'm guessing. You. It's unfair not to... Okay, but uh, as All far right. as I can That's see... Point number one. What else has he done? He's backed away from the Warren Commission, and if he does go for election, would he dare put that through before he went for a vote? He won't get it without closure, Jack. In other words, the NDP, your policy, as Barrett told me, would be to make it very difficult to pass that bill. That's right. Has closure ever been used? Not that I'm aware of. I can never remember I can't in BC remember either. In BC, no. Have you lost confidence in, in the speaker? What's his name? Walter Davidson already? I, I wouldn't comment on that. I, I, I think uh, that uh, there may be some problem, but let's, let's watch it. After all, uh, the man's been in the chair for a couple of weeks, three weeks. Uh, let's give him a full session. Hey, Bennett won the battle over John Fryer and the BCGEU, and that has been removed by and large, I would imagine, as a sore among government employees in Victoria. So therefore, that's a, a plus on his side, isn't it? I would say so. Uh, but it's, it's a plus more for, for you and Fryer on the air, actually. You mean for our little wheeling and dealing on the air into which yeah. Mr. Bennett jumped very alertly? Well, I think that you should be hired by the government to negotiate on behalf of the, of the administration with the BCGEU. Are you think... accusing me of being a social creditor by any chance? No, just a good labor negotiator. Well, a man with some common sense, perhaps. <laughs> okay, what else is, could he go as an issue for an election on? What I... other issues are there? Right at the moment, it's just a miasma of indecision for me. Mm -hmm. uh, not for me, but for what appears to be the position of the government. Well, I thought he was going to go on his restraint package, but now he's oh, brought in this bill. about the restraint package. Yeah. Well, I know why you have. He's brought in a bill that will permit the government to borrow at any time, without permission of the legislature, unlimited amounts. Treasury bills. Treasury bills. They're not bad. They're terrible. Why are they terrible? Because Surely the time to borrow a couple of hundred million on a short-term 30-day, 60-day, 90-day note is now when interest rates are declining. They can borrow now on 90-day periods. That's not what they want. They want an unlimited borrowing power by way of Treasury bills without permission of the legislature. Remember when he said no dime without debate? And yeah. we're going to have a billion without debate. He can borrow much more than that. There's unlimited amounts. Are you telling me the government, when the House is not in session, can't borrow by special warrant at any time? Yes, they can borrow by special warrant now, but they have to justify that within, within the rules of the legislature immediately. Uh, now they want a printing press in the basement to the Premier's office with Hugh Curtis and Bill Bennett cranking out these Treasury bills. It's their idea of freedom of the press, I guess. Well, they've got the freedom of the printing press. Yeah. But they've got to have money, one, to start subsidizing the mortgage thing. That'll take 10 million in the first month, won't it? But you see, this is a government of restraint, Jack. They've got to have money for what else? They've got to have money for the hospitals. They've got to make up another 30 million on the hospitals, having got 30 from the doctors. The last two legislative sessions, the NDP moved to cut back on government advertising, government travel, and government office space. The total amount of cutbacks, and this is only the increases that they wanted, that we wanted them to roll back, was $192 million. That was in the last session. The last two sessions. Now, why didn't the government accede to any of our requests? In other words, why didn't they vote for our moves to cut back? Is Doug Heal and his uh, paraphernalia still working over there? Oh, sure they are. They're putting out the glossy pamphlets at public taxpayers' cost. They're advertising at taxpayers' costs. Ministers are still traveling all over the world at taxpayers' cost. We can't afford it, Jack. And then he's got an economic recovery program, which came out in what you would describe as glossy guck. Not one job is in that pamphlet. Don Phillips admitted that. 
Oh, I know. Clem Chapel put them through on that. That was just delightful, <laughs> Clem. It's true. We're going to take phone calls to Gary Locke and to Webster on the political scene in British Columbia. We'll try and keep it bright. Difficult though it is on occasion. After the break. <laughs> No comment is necessary from you, but if Al Passarelli says he shot a grizzly bear, you take it from me, he shot a grizzly bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be one of the great laughs. I had a jolly program in politics this morning. Make us laugh. Go ahead, please. Mr. Locke? Yes, sir? If you are able to shake up the financial community of the country, why can't you and your colleague shake up the Socrates in Victoria? But we're working on that, sir. The, the, the uh, difficulty there is that we need an election for that. And uh, Why do you need an election for that? What about some vibrant attacks on the floor of the legislature? Oh, they're there all the time. Covered as they are by the magnificent reportage of the print and broadcast media. Well, it's, I'm loath to attack the press gallery, but some of the debates, some of the, the more interesting debates, are not always covered in full. I see. And... Uh, uh, but we do uh, make every effort to uh, to attack the Socrates uh, where we think that they're vulnerable. And one area that they're vulnerable is, is that they pretend to be fiscal managers at the same time they've mismanaged the economy and their own books for the last two years in a very bad way. Mm -hmm. Caused us some problems. How would you like to see them shaken up, Carla? Oh, I guess there's all kinds of issues that could be... Uh, Brought, brought up and discussed, such as a, uh, education and the economy. Education and the economy and expense accounts from social credit cabinet ministers. That would be a good one, wouldn't it? That's a really juicy one. That's a juicy one. But uh, that's all been tightened up and cleared away, hasn't it, from nope. the other side of the house? No. Eh? I think that the, the security is better. <laughs> But uh, I'm not convinced. If, if the Socreds did not accept our move to cut back on their own ministerial travel to save money, then I'm not convinced. That I'm not taking them seriously when they say they're on a restraint program. Except that the Premier now flies economy to conference he's not over with only one assistant. Big deal. I think we, it's silly. I think you should fly first class and arrive there properly rested. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, the, the big point is that, that the major cuts that we moved were rejected by the Socreds. And I therefore say their restraint program is not to be taken seriously. Go ahead, please, to Gary Locke. I've got a question for Gary. Um, I am unemployed, Gary. And yes, uh, what I'd really like to hear from you is, is the attitude that I should take towards the teachers and the BCGEU in this period of economic, uh, let's face it, depression. Uh, what should be my attitude to the teachers and the, and the members of BCGEU demanding higher wages and everybody employed and no layoffs and all the rest of it. Good question. Okay, I think, I think what you're saying to me is that I'm unemployed and what are they complaining about? I, I, I say to you, yes, I can understand how you feel that way. The big problem that we have is trying to convince the uh, Social Credit Administration that they should go on a full-scale economic recovery program no, no, to Gary get you Locke, a job. You are not answering the man's question. He's putting it to you very succinctly. He's an unemployed guy, perhaps uh, an NDP supporter uh, in sympathy in some way or another. And he's saying to you, are you Gary Locke asking me to sit still for the teachers who have an average wage of 33000 thousand, many with much more than that, while I am on unemployment insurance and be taxed in any way? to bring them up to par or beyond, those okay. and the BCGEU. Is it a fair share of suffering? Okay, look, that's because everybody's bought the government line, and they shouldn't. The government line is that, the, the, that we're only treating teachers the same way that everybody else should be treated. Not The education system is getting cut back by 6%. We're talking about teachers' salaries or no, teachers... I'm, I'm not, I'm not, Jack, I'm not saying, I'm not saying uh, that, that the... Uh, that, uh, that these people should be unemployed as well. I'm just saying that what is wrong with last year's salary? I'm not saying Nothing. that they should not continue working. I certainly don't want them to be unemployed. 
What I want them to, to look at is that this is a period of economic depression. I want these guys to realize that there are other members of this society that, in fact, have a hard time. And I, they should be fairly uh, considerate and do not demand the 6 and 10 and 15 percent increases. Let them just stick with what they got last time. They got 17.3 percent in 1982 contracts. Okay. okay, they can stay with that. They okay. can stay with that, but not demand more this year because the economy cannot support them. Okay, I will call her. I think that's a good point. What's happening next year, from my impression about the teachers, uh, is that they're going to take a 6% cut. That's what the bill stands for. Uh, and certainly some of them were even negotiating uh, cutting back and rolling back salary. That's not the point. Uh, the, the point that you're making is that, that uh, it's pretty hard to be sympathetic with people with a job. And I, uh, I think that we'd best get on with trying to increase Let's employment. Let's try on one problems. other one. The BCGEU this year got, regardless of how, at 6% from 3 to 13%. They got 6%, which cost the government $65 million. Why, says this man, I'm sure, should they get anything when the economy is in such a distraught? In, in, when you had Fryer on, he, in fact, stated that some people were getting 17 percent. Nah, he was pushing it, but I'll well, just... pushing it. It's 6 percent they got overall. Sure. Yeah, I... Look... How do you justify it? Well, look, it, the collective bargaining process took its, its uh, place. The government uh, gave them the increase, and now they're voting on it. Uh, well, I don't no, think it's appropriate for us to, to discuss... Supposing, supposing the NDP was in. Now, this is just a hypothetical. I'm not trying to smear you. And supposing they turned around and said, okay, We'll give you 15%. We won't cut education costs. This man would be mad no. in times of major unemployment. No. Look. I'm a house owner in, uh, in Vancouver, and I have to pay taxes, and it, and it looks like Vancouver is going to have a, uh, a deficit. The city of Vancouver is going to have a deficit, which means my taxes are going to go up anyway, including, including uh, paying for, for teachers and uh, civil servants both in the in the city and and in the yeah. province. Okay, look. What should be my attitude? Should I should I accept them as 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 uh, equal members of this society and so on? I I have the attitude that they're money grabbing. They don't realize what the hell's going on economically. Okay, I don't agree with you entirely. Some are, some aren't. Let's look at it fairly. Let's look in, at it fairly what? after the break. Please, oh, I'm running okay. late. Thanks for calling. I'll finish this with Gary Locke after the break. I think that caller got you. I think that caller wanted you to say, in times of restraint, civil servants and teachers should get nothing else. Okay, the amount that they should get is, is, is up to a reasonable look at what the, the government can afford in a restraint time. Okay, I agree with the caller as far as that's concerned. The, the question is, should we believe the government or, and trust the government's word about uh, what's fair under the circumstances? Do you know that, that, that in the province of British Columbia, the homeowner pays for school costs. The homeowner, his property taxation. Uh, we have one of the lowest contributions from the provincial treasury to schools in they're, the districts. They're, they're in a billion or a half a billion dollar deficit position. Well, it's not. The, the, look, you, you asked about homeowner taxation. More and more of the school's burden, no matter how much they cut back, is going on to the homeowner. The one thing you'll agree with me on that Bennett is in deep financial trouble. I think that he's mismanaged the situation sufficiently to put us in real trouble. Right, and he shot right. the money. Probably. And something's got to be cut. Probably. We haven't seen the books. Okay. You sound like Pacific Press. Go ahead, please. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a government worker, so I know what wastage of money is all about. I see it every day. And uh, in the education system, I can believe that there's a lot of places to cut back, but mm. definitely teachers is not one of them. Any teachers I've seen, they would really work hard. Have they been pampered with two, not pampered, but in the affluent days, did they get too many aids, too much equipment, too much this and that, not enough work, five teaching hours a day? All, all I can say is that I am watching two children grow up right now through the school system, and what they are learning is tremendous, and you just don't cut back on teachers and teaching aids. You just can't. Good call. Yeah. Thank you. That's fair. Go ahead, please. 
Uh, good morning. Mr. Locke has obviously benefited from his long vacation. I hardly recognize him. So moderate, reasonable, and immaculate. Quite different from the days when in the house here, uh, Mr. Barrett said give him hell, and he gave him Locke, Lee, and Levy, the wild men. It's very pleasant to see him being so reasonable. You're, I would just you're very like charming yourself, him. sir. Thank you. I would just like to ask him, uh, why confrontation all the time? Why is it necessary in his new and moderate move? Why is it necessary for everybody to confront each other? I agree. It is wrong today. Totally wrong times today. For people to be fighting against each other. Okay. They should be working with each other. Okay. Time for a national provincial government with NDP and social credit. Hang in on. the same bag. Hang on. The man has made one of the most important points I've heard in, in weeks. In my view, we've got to sit down together. Things are too serious economically to be playing political football with issues. We've got to cooperate between the various groups in society to, to get a handle on economic recovery. We can't do it by bludgeoning one group. The, it's doctors one day, it's teachers the next. It's, uh, it's going to be... Uh, uh, civil servants it was last week, who's it going to be next? My point is, Jack, the time is now to work together to solve our economic problems, and we can do it. We did it before, and we can do it now. I really appreciate when that When did call. we do it before? Prior to 1963? No, we did it in the 1930s. We did it in the... Sure we did. Well, <laughs> do you think that this, the Western world solved its economic problem in the 30s by any sane planning? No, we made the same mistakes, but the problem is, is that we pulled out with uh, w with uh, an uplift to the, the war to the machine created okay even pre-war uh, employment and post-war prosperity to a point i know but economic recovery was underway it was slow but it was underway because we started pulling together i can't ever remember people pulling together well, i wasn't even born then during I'm going, war i'm going to the history from hazelton books. go ahead please oh hello mr webster yes ma'am just been listening to your program and uh it reminded me of a few things that I'd seen recently uh, on this school pro uh, cutbacks and the teachers uh, foo for all. I noticed on Saturday uh, there was a soccer program. There was a busload of kids had a 130-mile trip, 65 there and 65 back. Uh, so that type of program is still going on. I personally saw a note from a school principal to a uh, pupil's parent. It was on some beautiful, heavy, embossed paper. The government doesn't use that kind of paper. You mean there's wastage in the system? That's one thing that um, I don't think that there's much restraint in the school program. Another thing that really reminded me of uh, an incident that took place a number of years ago, and I heard a man say, if the people are not careful, the teachers will be running the country. And right now, it looks to me as though that is what they're trying to do. Thank you, ma'am. I don't think the teachers are trying to run the country. They're merely trying to protect their own privileged position. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Webster? Yes, sir. Mr. Locke, uh, what's this screwball idea about Metro selling buses to lower time finance and then leasing them back again. Okay, you know, that is the most amazing thing that the government's trying to get away with. They're trying the same program they did with the ferries. They sold them to a finance company and are leasing them back, and in the long term, the taxpayer is paying out more and more money. And we're doing the same with buses through which finance company? With buses. I think it's Laurentide. The caller said, I think that's the one. Gary, we must leave it there. Gary Locke, okay. NDP Vancouver Centre. We'll see some of your colleagues and some of the government members this afternoon in Victoria, and I'll be back after the break. Tomorrow, a Webster report from the Parliament buildings in Victoria. We're also going to chat up that rather tough guy, Walter Stewart. Remember they wrote Shrug, Trudeau and Power? He's done one on the banks now with towers of gold and feet of clay, I think it is. Webster, tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Webster plays with Canucks on Czech TV at midnight precisely. Special report from Victoria tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely.